Now, conformal symmetry related to crossing, which tells you that you can expand a sprock in, o, in OPE channels. And conformal symmetry tells you that the convergence of the OPE channels the representation is, has overlapping convergence. So in one channel, you can get the full answer that matches with the other channels. So the conformal symmetry is usually used in this concept. So you have the crossing symmetry. And so using these, the, the notion is trying to use these two constraints to start to carve out the space. I'd just like to present this, uh, this, this picture in the Quanta magazine in uh, 2017. And notice that it was talking about this space, and this space is really part of a bigger space, which uh, it, it, it labels unknown polyhedron. And uh, so basically, that this talk will be to give a characterization of what this unknown polyhedron precisely is. So uh, let me make this uh, the goal a little bit more precise. So let me just uh, use the one DCFT to make my point uh, here. So, so let's talk about so the, the fundamental. Uh, fundamentally, the, the bootstrap problem is a geometric problem. Uh, the reason is that, as I mentioned, you have two constraints. You have unitarity and you have crossing. These two constraints are actually a geometric constraint. So you can. So let's just expand this. Let's just consider the one DCFT where the block is just a hypergeometric function, and then we let's do a Taylor expansion around z equals to one half. Okay, so that's the self dual the, the, the self dual point. So basically, you have the idea that your four point function will be expanded in Taylor series of z. So you have these Taylor coefficients, and then you can have this block, and then you just also expand it in Taylor series, and then you have this so-called block vector. Okay, so basically, the statement of unitarity tells you that this four point function is given by the positive sum of these block vectors, and we know that this is the notion of convex hall that the four-point function must live inside of convex all of a sum of, of, a sum of vectors. Now, what crossing symmetry is also telling, is telling you that these, these Taylor plot, these Taylor coefficients must satisfy some relation. Uh, because, uh, because this tells you, for example, this tells you that, uh, that the odd is going to be related to the even. And so these Taylor coefficients are not unconstrained. They're actually constrained. And they're constrained by this, this format, which depends on, of course, the, op, the conformal dimension of your external algorithm. So in a nutshell, uh, basically, you have a geometry. And the geometry is basically telling you that the blocks form a polytope, the convex hull. And the four-point functions must live on a subplane. And this subplane is intersecting this polytope. So this is the geometry of the problem. Uh, for any consistent CFP, the four-point function must lie within this region. Where is the intersection of the unitary block given by the convex of these vectors and the crossing plane, which is determined by this crossing symmetry? Okay. What is this space? This space is basically the this basically the, the, the coefficients of these Taylor series. The, the, no, the, the, the coefficient of, of, of the, so these are block vectors that you expand the coefficient. So if, if I expand to nth order in my Taylor expansion then the space I'm talking about is living in n dimension. Yeah, so it's basically how, how far I'm expanding the Taylor expansion of my whole point function. Of course, so this is not, the, the real problem is that you have, so when you're talking about all the possible spectrum of your CFP, you're talking about all the possible unitary blocks because the, the spectrum can be different, so the involved vector can be different. So you're playing around with this possibly you're trying to switch these blocks to consider different configuration. And so for a different spectrum, this corresponds to a different block. And for this spectrum to be consistent, all you're asking is just that this, this block, this, this polytope here has to intersect this point. And that's it, and that's the geometry. So the problem is that we don't really exactly know what is the, the, the polytope that you're looking at. And so your, your, your space is really a space of all possible polytopes and how it is intersecting the plane. So this so, is general infinite dimension. Yeah, this is general infinite dimension. So this is a little bit uh, hard to uh, think about what is the precise way to talk about this. But So let's look at how numeric bootstrap people are doing this. So the way that they're doing this is not to think about this geometry. So they're basically saying, OK, so first of all, they reorganize the crossing symmetry equation. They put uh, the, the block vectors and the, and the crossing symmetric version together and take the difference. Of course, it, if it's crossing symmetric, the sum has to be zero, and therefore to have the sum over a positive sum of these functions to be zero. And then they consider, okay, so let's say we have a linear function. So let's I'll call this linear function W. 
And the linear function is a derivative acting, one version is it will be just derivative acting on this f function here, which is the difference between the blocks uh, in this crossing image. And so basically, uh, basically you just have this linear because it's acting on the block linear. And so when acting on the crossing symmetry equations, it says that the omega acting on this has to be zero. Now, if we plot out omega on any, any of a single block, so any random, let's say we should have so random, any random a1, a3, a2, n, then you'll get some function that looks like this. So why does this contain information about the, the, for example, the gap that you're interested in? Well, it's, it, it's, it's simple. So you see that after this, this point here, the, 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 this function now becomes always positive beyond this point, right? And the point is that this functional when act on this equation has to be zero, but this is a positive sum. So if all of the deltas are sitting after this delta star, if all the deltas are sitting after the delta star, that means that omega acting on f is always positive, and you're having a positive sum over something that is positive, and therefore this cannot be zero. And that's why this point here tells you where the gap is. And when, whenever, if all the operator is sitting beyond this, point, there's no way that this, that this, when the optimal, when the functional acting on this space can be actually satisfied this equation. So that's how numeric bootstrap people uh, approach this problem. And basically, what they do is they put this equation into the computer and they search for all possible a's because each each optimal functional is parameterized by these a coefficients. So they tune all these possible a's such that they can find a functional that this zero, this, this last zero, the last root is actually the smallest. So that's basically, in a nutshell, what numerical bootstrap is doing. So, the, the, so this is the optimal functional is the statement that you have a, a collection of A such that uh, the, when omega is acting on this F, the largest root is the smallest. So this presents a question. So we know that the original problem is geometric. I mean, like I said, it's just a problem of polytope intersecting the, intersecting the crossing plane. So why is the boundary of this solution so non-geometric? Why is it when we talk about where is the last polytope that is possible to intersect the crossing plane, you have to go through numerics and they have to scan over all possible and they have these improved algorithm to, to get, the, to get the, 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 the optimal bound uh, more precisely, why is this so non-geometric? Uh, it must be, a, if the original problem is geometric, then there must be a geometric statement about what that optimal function. And indeed, there are strong indications that there's a there's deep structure behind this optimal function, as many of you have heard that indeed, the, 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 the optimal function for a slightly related problem, which I'll discuss later on, uh, the modular boost spread actually matches to the linear program we found for the sphere backing density. Uh, so these are two different problems. One is modular invariance, we're talking about the spectrum. The other question is we're talking about lattice and densest packing. And somehow for these two completely different physical problems, it turns out that when you run through the numerical bootstrap, the, the optimal function that you get is the same optimal function. Okay. And so there, this tells you that this optimal function is something that is actually a very interesting uh, object to think about. And so we're going to think a little bit about this. And if, of course, if, you, if there's something interesting about it, then it must be that their underlying geometry problem is not some random geometric problem. And indeed, uh, so uh, the, the original problem that I talked about polytope intersecting, uh, sorry, the crossing plane intersecting the unitary polytope, uh, it turns out that this unitary polytope, when you talk about, for, for example, for 1D set, is actually a very special polytope. So remember that. Uh, this polytope was constructed by summing over all the possible conformal blocks, right? And in principle, you can have, well, not in principle, actually, for, for all generic CFT, you have an infinite number of operators, so you have an infinite number of, of block vectors. This is an infinite problem. So that's why initially that you need, people thought, well, just go to numerics directly, because this is an infinite dimension problem. You have all sorts of vectors. You know, just finding the boundary of this complex on this case is, 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 is basically non doable But uh, in a paper that, uh, that uh, in collaboration with Imara Khani Hameg and Shu and Xiao last year, we found that this, this, poly, this, uh, this infinite polytope is actually not random. It's actually a very special polytope. It's such, it's, in particular, it's so special that we already, there's no computation that is needed. You already know what the boundary of this polytope is. So, Basically, the, the statement is that the vectors of the, the conformal blocks, so these are the conformal block vectors, they actually satisfy a very special property. 
and said if you, you if you have n of them and if you do the Taylor expansion to n, then you take the determinant of this. It turns mm -hmm. out that this determinant will always be positive so long as so long as your conformal dimension is ordered. And this special property, which I'll mention where this property is also emerging in different in other places, tells you that the convex hull is a special hull. It's, it's, it's what is called a cyclic polytope. And it immediately tells you that the boundaries take this form. So it depends on which dimension you're, ex you're doing Taylor expansion in all dimension or even that dimension. You see that the, the, the boundary is given by the vertices, which are basically the, the identity operator, i plus 1, jj plus 1. There's i plus 1, jj plus 1, and the identity operator for even if there's i plus 1, jj plus 1. It's basically just pairs. So the, uh, the boundaries of this polytope is just coming in pairs. And here, and you're saying, you're saying that what, what, that, what do I mean by pair? So basically, if you're assuming a continuous spectrum i plus 1 just means i and the derivative of i of the conformal plot. So let me just give you a, a brief uh, one minute explanation for why the boundary takes that form. So, we, so we're thinking about convex hull. So what is a convex hull? A convex hull is just a sum of vectors where the, all the vectors are just positive. Yeah, you can think of it as computing the center of mass, because the center of mass is a sum of positions, and the position is weighted by mass, and the mass is positive. So the, so the convex hull is essentially thinking about, uh, about a, a finite region. So if you think about two dimension, and let's say you have these vectors here, and then you can ask what is the vector that, that determines the boundary? What is different between BC and what is different compared to AC, which is not a boundary? Of course, we know just by drawing graphically, you know that all the, 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 the polygon is on one side of BC, and therefore that's why it's a boundary. Whereas some of the polygon is actually on one side and some is the other. In particular, some are actually on the line of AC. So that means that when you're taking the, the determinant of A, U, A, U, C, there's going to be some part of A which is going to be sit on the side here. So that means that some part of A is going to have a determinant with U, A, U, C, they're going to be coline, collinear, and therefore they're going to be zero. Which means, since this is a zero, that means the sign on these sides are different. They're crossing the, the zero. So that tells you that to, to, to determine what the boundary is, it comes down to determine the sign of determinants. So in other words, if there's a boundary, then that means for A, any A that is constructed like this, it must satisfy that determined A of UI, UJ is bigger than zero for any A. Then that tells you what the boundary is. That tells you that UI, UJ is a boundary. So why is a cyclic polytope already, you already know what the boundary is? So remember, as I mentioned, you have a, if you have a bunch of vectors and they're ordered, then, the, then if they're ordered I1 for some order, and here it's just conformal dimension. But for some ordering, the determinant is if it's always bigger than zero. Mathematically, this is what they call a cyclic <coughs> polytope. And you know what the boundary is. It always, the boundary is just comprised of, of vertices which are just coming in pair. So let me just show you a quick example of why this is true. So let's say, let's say we're taking this determinant. And I, to, I tell you that all of these ordered, uh, my ordered determinants are positive. So I claim that u4, u5, u7, u8 has to be a boundary. Why? Because let's take A, which can be linear combination of u6 and u9, just random linear combination. You can take any other linear combination. And since it's a convex hull, it's inside a convex hull, so A and B is bigger than zero. You take stick A in here, so you have A times u6 and B times u9. So A and B is positive. Uh, this is not ordered, but because of the fact that these are coming in pairs, so you know you can just jump two and then this becomes ordered. And similarly, it just jumps four steps and this becomes ordered. Since these are always in pairs, so that means that you always is just even number of jumps away from being ordered. And so that means that your A time, you're having a positive times positive and B times positive, and therefore this thing is definitely positive. That tells you why these are the boundaries. Okay. So once you have a convex hull that's a cyclic polytope, you know that that's a boundary. Okay, so knowing this, so we can come back and see what the, what the problem is. So let's look at the original geometric pop, uh, picture. We're asking for a unitary polytope that intersects the crossing plane. So let's consider d equals 2m plus 1. Uh, so when you're, when you're getting used to this, this is just becomes uh, just straightforward. But, uh, for, but really, there's nothing, there's, there's nothing uh, complicated about these 2n and n. So, th so just bear with me. So for, for the crossing plane, it's going to be n dimensions. So for example, for n equals 2, which means you're doing a Taylor expansion to five derivatives. So you have these coefficients here. 
the crossing plane tells you it's spanned by these two, these uh, these three vectors. That's why it's two dimension. You're requiring the crossing plane to intersect the n dimension space of the face of the polytope. So this is a face. So that means you need a collection of operators, and it intersects at a point. And the intersection point you can directly write down is given in this form. Uh, and the, for the point to be inside the polytope, you just have that A dotted into the polytope, it has to be positive. And that tells you that this has to have the same sum. So since I think this, this will be uh, loaded, the, 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 the slide will be loaded on the website. So you can come back and look at this later. So I'll just go through this briefly. The important thing is that there, here there's a sign that the constraint is coming from this sign. And therefore, so for example, if I take n equals 2, the geometry, once I project through x, x and 0, which is a crossing plane and the identity, which is I'm looking at a geometry perpendicular to the crossing plane, and, 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 and identity is going to be two-dimensional. So I've drawn how this, how, the, how this geometry looks like. So here, the red line is where all the curve, all the conformal blocks are living. Conformal blocks are living. And the geometry is that I need to find three points on the, the on the blocks such that such that it enclose zero. That's the intersecting condition. So if, if I have any CFT, so for example, if I start from if I have any CFT, I need to, on this curve I need to find the CFT must con, contain at least three points such that three points enclose this zero. This zero. That's a consistent uh, CFT. Okay. Good. So I, I basically formulated what the geometry is. So what the heck does it have to do with the, with the optimal function? Okay, so let, let's remind let's, let me remind let's remind ourselves what the optimal functional is doing. The optimal functional acting on the block vector is supposed to produce this kind of graph, right? What is special about this kind of graph? This kind of graph has a specialty that after some point it becomes always positive. Right? That's why you can say something about the gap. That's the point of the optimal function. Now, we already know that the vectors actually form a cyclic polytope. Now, what is, so we can conjecture that if I write my optimal functional as taking a determinant of this form, where this all comes in uh, pairs, then for sure that for any delta here, in principle, this thing should be positive, right? just because of the cyclic polytope problem. Okay. Of course, this is not entirely true because I have the crossing plane at a zero. So that means that when, I'm, when the deltas are sufficiently close to the conformal dimension of the external guys because of the projection through the crossing plane, uh, this is just going to give you, this is, this is going to mess up your cyclic polypro a little bit. But you know that at least for a sufficiently large delta, this is going to be definite positive. Okay? So let's start with this functional. So I'm going to, at any fixed dimension, I'm going to start with this functional. And I know that it's going to pr produce something that looks like this. So, of course, if I fix this dimension that takes this form, then I need to tell you what delta i1 is, delta i2 is, and delta ik is. So we need to a collection of k points to precisely define this function. Now, let's, let me, let's remind ourselves of the geometry. The geometry at fix n is n-dimensional when projected toward x0. OK, great. So in n-dimensional, we're looking for n plus 1 vertices to form a simplex to enclose the origin. Now, but we don't want any random simplex here. We want the simplex that corresponds to the gap. So if it corresponds to the gap, that means that you're tuning any of these vertices. The, 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 this is going to be a, a, an invalid CFT, right? That's the point of the gap. Any small perturbations around the gap is going to throw you into an inconsistent, uh, inconsistent uh, spectrum. So that means that this simplex <coughs> must be degenerate. Okay? And moreover, the gap must be on one of the, the vertices. So this must be a degenerate simplex where the gap is one of its versity, uh, vertices. And therefore, we are looking for k points and the gap, which forms k plus 1 uh, points on the curve, and to form a k-dimension subplane that enclose the origin. That's your right to enclose the origin. So, in other words, the, 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 the equation that you want to solve is just solve for delta 1, delta 2, delta k. And you can put any random v here, and this has to be 0 because this is the coplane condition. Okay? And the important thing is that this, you can just plug in any v1, v2, vk, because if it's coplane, it doesn't matter what the vectors are, they have to be 0. So you can use this to solve for what the delta 1, delta n is, and to solve for what these are. And it's, 
And it turns out that ND is, is exactly what the computer is giving us. Okay, so we, we so basically we start with this uh, functional or for this ansatz for the functional and for there's a difference between whether n is odd or n is even. But basically we, we just and there's a geometric understanding for what these uh, uh, why is these two. And you can just we can solve this functional either using this condition, which is the sorry, which is the coplane the coplane condition, and just use this to solve it. And then compare with numerical bootstrap. And then here, the, these are the results that we get, we get out for different orders in derivative. And at each order in derivative, we get exactly the same result as you get from the numerical bootstrap. Okay. In other words, the numerical bootstrap program that gave you the optimal functional, it's actually still, well, the, the result of that optimal function is actually a special coplane condition uh, on the vertices of your plane, uh, of, 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 your, of your problem. And moreover, you can you can you can understand this very you can you can push this to even higher. You can now start to understand what this optimal function, when you push to infinite derivative orders, is trying to give you. Because all the optimal functions are, are giving to by, by this with something that comes in pair. That that means that there's double zeros here. So that means an infinite derivative, derivative order optimal function will look something like this with all of these double zeros. And we know that in, in, when you get to the infinite derivative order, you're going to put you're going to hit on the exact function. And then these if these double zero are precisely the the, spec, the physical spectrum of your of your of your theory because the gap you, the, the first operator is sitting here, and if everything has to sum to zero, all the remaining operators must exactly sit at these double zeros. And the reason that you sit you see this double zero is precisely because that you know the optimal functional is giving you something that is coming in pair. And why is the optimal uh, functional give you something that comes in pairs? Because it's a cyclic polytope. So, uh, how many time? How much time? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. So uh, the same. So the same. So let me just go a little bit uh, to tell you how far I can. You can push this. So the same uh, analysis is not only giving you information about just the first operator. It's actually giving you information about the entire spectrum because you can apply this iteratively. So, for example, you can use the same. Uh, analysis about how many number of the, the, the requirement that you need to have a simplex to enclose the origin. And for example, here is a bound on delta 1 and delta 2, even just at the 5 derivative order. So here, this is a delta 2 bound. And each region has a geometric interpretation in terms of what exactly are the, what exactly are the operators that are being bounded here. And just for this graph, for example, here, so this, this graph is bounding delta 1 and delta 2. In, this, in these two regions, this is telling that delta 3 is unbounded. Any delta 3 is OK. But this region, it starts to bound delta 3. And the region that it starts to bound delta 3 uh, is because delta is because uh, you have, is because that you're using delta 1, delta 2, and delta 3 to form that some points. And this, the, the bound for delta 3 is given by this functional here, which is a requirement that it, it, it forms that simplex. And again, you can run numerical with, uh, with optimal bounds on delta delta 2 and delta 3, and you'll find that these boundaries are exactly, that this geometric intersection gives you exactly the same thing as the bound. So let me uh, skip, and you can see that if you go to higher dimension, higher derivative waters, these different regions start to shrink. Um, an interesting uh, property is that you can also start to bound not just delta 1, delta 2, but consider it for fixed dimension and consider uh, the bound on all the possible operators. And then there's also another geometric a picture that starts to arise, and that is that since I'm, talk I'm talking about a set of operators that form a polytope that bounds zero, I didn't tell you whether or not these operators of delta one, delta two, are the first two, or the next two, or the or, or the or, or the ne or the the next two. So if delta, for example, so that tells you that in this picture, there's actually a region here, which is this region, and away from this region, this is when delta one and delta two are, are forming the, the simplex to bound the origin. But when delta 2 and delta 2 falls into this region, then it's no longer participating in this bounding procedure. Now it's delta 3, delta 4 that is bounding. And if delta 3, delta 4 also falls into this region, then it's delta 5, delta 6 that is bounding. And so this region is like an event horizon for operators. So any operator that falls into this event horizon is, is no longer participating in the bounding, the bounding of the, the forming the simplex. And it has nothing to do with the with the, the, the simplex that's intersecting the zero, and therefore, 
the, the full picture on delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, delta 4, delta 5 space is very interesting. So you have this for delta 1, delta 2. Inside here, you have another picture here, which is higher dimensional, but it's, it's exactly the same picture, but it's dumping delta 3 and delta 4. In that picture, it also has this region, and in that region, in that region, there's another dimension that is growing out as a bounding delta 5 and delta 6. So it's a repeating picture that is always repeating itself whenever the operators that you're looking at is falling into this horizon. So this is a, so this is a very interesting a geometric picture. And the, pre this, the precise point of this horizon is if you look at the optimal function, it's actually the first zero here. So, okay, time's up. So, uh, okay, I'll, I'll skip very fast. So, this, uh, so you can also find this, uh, there's a geometric interpretation for what the kink is, and this is a 2D CFT, and this is in a diagonal limit. And uh, so I'll just skip this. So there's also a precise geometric definition of the kink. Um, and you can also do this for modular bootstrap, because the modular bootstrap is also a, uh, is, is, is also a, uh, a, a similar geometric picture. And uh, yeah, so this, this, just for the modular bootstrap, exactly the same intersection picture gives the correct, uh, the correct optimal functional that matches with the numerical uh, bootstrap uh, uh, function. It's reproducing exactly the same function. So since I skipped a lot of things, so let me just summarize what I'm actually um, trying to convey in words. So we've seen that the geometry behind the bootstrap program can be approached analytically in many instances. So right now, the, 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 the examples we have is 1D CFT, 2D CFT in the diagonal limit, and the modular bootstrap. In particular, in each of these cases, the optimal functional, which characterizes the boundary of the theory space, is given by a degenerate simplex, which is unique. And you can just uniquely solve that, 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 that intersecting question and find that simplex. And so that means that this allows us to analytically solve what exactly the functionals are. And moreover, this functional it can be applied for globally for the spectrum. So this is not just telling you about the gap. This approach tells you about this, the gap for the second operator, which depends on the first operator, the third and the fourth and the fifth operator. If you know the first two the three operators, it tells you this is an iterator series of keep telling you what exactly is the boundary of this. And so this is basically carving out the space recursively. Uh, what was not mentioned and what was not concluded in this is some recent result uh, in, in, in the collaboration with the, the India group is that this same geometric in interpretation also has a, gives us a geometric definition of what all those kinks are. So as you can imagine, since these kinks are like different uh, shapes of, uh, so it's, if you think of it as different uh, slopes of the maximal bound, so that means the kink is a phase transition in which the optimal functional is shifting. So you have two different optimal functionals be besides the kink, and the optimal function becomes degenerate at the kink, so it must have a geometric definition. And indeed, we've identified what the geometric identification of the kink is. Furthermore, this geometric de definition can also give you bound on OPE. So there's also a geometric definition for, for the bound of each OPE coefficient is, because it's just, yeah, it's again an intersecting one. So this is really uh, a re really an interesting new picture of viewing the entire bootstrap program. And of course, there's a lot of things to do with the inclusion of spins and moving to the off the high domain. So let me just stop here. Thank you. Any question? Do you have some results when you include the spin dependence? Yeah, so we do have some partial results. So so we, we know so in, in, in certain so we know in certain regime of the parameter space, the higher spin so, so we can identify when the higher spin are actually inside the the inside the hall of the scalar curve. So, so you have the scalar and the spin. So if the if the if the if, if, we, if the spin uh, if the spin blocks are actually inside the convex hall of the scalar, then the spins are irrelevant. So first we know where does this happen. So when the spin becomes irrelevant, then you, all you need to know is just the scalar. So when the spin becomes relevant, which is usually the lower performer dimension, the spin becomes irrelevant. Then you can identify when, which 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 part of the which spins are actually on the outside. Which, or which, so in other words, if the, the problem is basically the following. So you have all the different spins, and you're taking, talking about the convex hall of all of them. So you're taking the Minkowski sum. The question is, what is the boundary of this of this Minkowski sum? And that you can have analytic control. So 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 yeah. So we can start to, to do that. And so for example, one thing that we're looking at. Is, so we, let's assume that you must you, you must have the stress tensor, so you at least have that spin two vertex over there, and what it, what the geometry now becomes. So, yeah, so basically, how much does this rely on the fact that one D and two D C D that 